Yeah, how you doing everybody? It's Thursday the 24th of June 2010 and it's just in, in the early afternoon and I thought I was going to do something different but I, I, I just want to try and finish off what I initiated yesterday when I was talking about these elitists and uh, their whole behaviour and uh, I haven't really sort of thought this out too clearly so just you'll have to bear with me basically all I want to say is that they have a commonality and the commonality is that they share a disease they all have a disease all of these guys have a disease and <clears throat> when when you look up any of the sick or if you speak to anybody who's anyway qualified in uh, psychology they look at you with two heads if you say you know what I'm going to say. We'll, we'll we'll work through this as 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 I say through this little this little video, and uh, <clears throat> really the only way I can I can describe all this is again by some sort of a parody or by an example, okay, um, sort of a parable or whatever. And uh, about twenty years ago, I was employed by the richest man in Ireland, and I had been employed by him for. Reasonable, reasonable amount of time, on and off, not not, not all the time. And uh, I did work for him, I did research for him. And uh, anyway, that lasted for a good period of years, okay? For, for a number of years. Not an awful long time, it's a good four or five years, five or six years. And uh, what happened was. Uh, one day it was Christmas week, I think it was the year was 1987 and uh, we'd had a late fall of snow and I had my business in the middle of Dublin at the time, I had a little tiny business in the middle of Dublin, little tiny office and I came out of the office one day and I was walking down the street, as I say right in the heart of the city centre and right beside where uh, the, the parliament buildings are in Dol and I saw a man who I hadn't seen in a while lying in a, a corner of a, a shop door and uh, he's an alcoholic and I, I knew him to speak to for several years and he would have been approximately the same age as myself he was in his sort of mid early mid 40s at the time and uh, as I say it was bad weather and he looked very very shook up and very distressed now uh, this man was completely disenfranchised by society. Um, he had no economic value to society at all. He was... Society had crushed him. He was probably mentally ill, the man. But the manifestation of his illness came through alcohol. And what he did was he drank himself into a stupor every day. Just to survive that day and then get carried into the next day and hope that the same thing would happen the following day. Um, he wasn't a professional beggar or anything, he didn't, didn't beg for a profession, he just sat there and if you wanted to give him something you give it to him, if you didn't you didn't and uh, I presume when he got really hungry or he got really tired he, he sought refuge somewhere, he must have known where, where there was somewhere maybe dry or whatever but he was in a hell of a state the day I saw him and what happened was uh, I went over and engaged him in a conversation, tried to get him up off the ground because he was saturated with, with the snow, with a sort of sleet had saturated his clothes, <clears throat> got him some money and tried to take him over in the general direction of a big restaurant in the middle of Dublin called Beauty's, try and get him some food but he wasn't interested in food and basically I just left the man alone because the man was on, I, I didn't have to, I didn't have the wherewithal to help the man. All I could do was just be offering humanity. That's all I could do. I couldn't, couldn't do any more. Anyway, what I did not know was that this all happened to say in a main street, one of the main shopping streets, on the corner of one of the main shopping streets in Dublin. And what I did not know was that the elitist's wife, the man who was the number one man in Ireland at the time, the wealthiest man in Ireland, who I worked for, his wife, witnessed all this from a fitting room on the first floor of one of these multinational shops where she was buying a coat or 
whatever, I don't know what she was wearing, some, some apparel, some piece of a female apparel. And she witnessed this through a window. <clears throat> How I know, I'll tell you in a moment, I know this. What happened was then, so that happened on Christmas week, and about four or five days passed, and uh, we were into the period between Christmas and the New Year. And uh, my phone rang at home, and I got invited to go up to the house, his home, which is in the middle of Ireland, about 50 miles from where I lived, uh, to go and to meet him. Uh, because him and his wife were going away on a holiday, an extended holiday, and he wanted to <clears throat> speak to me about what I was doing about this particular thing that I was researching for him. All right. I went up to his house, which is, you can only describe it as a massive Georgian mansion with servants and housekeepers and everything else. And uh, I was ushered in and he was on his way. He, ha he was away visiting someone else and he was on his way back to the house and his wife was there. His wife brought me into the library, sat me down, gave me a cup of coffee. And uh, in the immediate conversation after about the weather, because the weather was pretty bad that particular year, <clears throat> we were, she asked me about this particular man that I'd, she'd seen me with in Dublin. Did I know the man? Who was the man? Did I have a relationship with the man? Uh, she saw me giving the man money. Uh, I was very friendly towards the man, very well disposed towards the man. I spent a long time with the man. So I was thinking, where is this conversation? What is this all about? Anyway, I thought to myself, this is going to end here. This conversation is ending now, right now. This is nobody's business, but but my business and the man's business. So I basically said the following to her. I sort of shouldn't have maybe said it, but I did say it. I said, look, the way it is is this. This man is lost to the world. This man's an alcoholic. He's disenfranchised. He's dispossessed. He has not got anything. He's lying like a rag, a rag doll in the corner of a shop to get some sort of relief from the elements, okay? He only lives for one thing, and that's alcohol. And the alcohol gives him a release from what is haunting him. Now, I said, he wears his badge quite openly. When you go up to him, you can sense what he is three foot away from him because you can smell him. He stinks of urine, human urine, and drink alcohol. That's what he stinks of. He probably doesn't have control of his body functions. He's not interested in food. He's not interested in anything. He is an addict, a drug addict. He's only interested in alcohol. That's all. The alcohol lifts in some small way the horrors that he's living out in his mind. But I said to her, I want to tell you something. There are other people in this world who share the same type of existence. They're addicts as well. And they're addicts to money. But they don't wear their badge here. But they have as much of an addictive and addiction problem as the man lying in the gutter. Well, it went down like a lead balloon. She knew exactly what and who I was talking about. Her husband arrived at the front door about five minutes later. I spent about one minute, one and a half minutes with her husband. And I never saw the couple again in my life. The reason being, I had pointed out to her that her husband was a drug addict. Just as veritable and just as truthful as the man lying in the gutter. The man lying in the gutter was addicted to alcohol. Her husband was addicted to money. No difference. Absolutely no difference. In an economic sense, maybe different, but in a social and a real sense and in a human sense, no different. Both of them needed treatment. And that's all really I want to say. I don't really want to say any more. I think I've stirred a little bit of a, 
a hornet's nest by saying what I've seen, so, said so far. I don't mean now. I don't know what the response is going to be to this. But it's there to be responded to.